Sister Claire Crockett, servant sister of the home of the mother, alone with Christ alone. Chapter 13, Conquest of the Youth for Christ. The Jacksonville sisters and a group of young college students were on a walking pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady of La Leche in St. Augustine, Florida. The feast of the Immaculate Conception was coming up and they wanted to give Our Lady this gift on her feast day. The shrine is built on the location where the first Thanksgiving Mass was celebrated in the United States in the 1500s by Spanish missionaries. The group started at the parish of St. Paul at Jacksonville Beach, 30 miles away from the shrine, and in the evening they stopped halfway at the house of some friends to spend the night. Everyone was exhausted and sweaty, with sunburned faces, aching muscles and blistered feet. No one had any particular desire to talk or to do anything at all. Sister Claire spent a few seconds observing all the girls' faces and realised something needed to be done to lift up their spirits. She did not want the devil to take advantage of this moment to create discouragement and remove some of the spiritual fruits of the walk. Pilgrimages are precisely about sacrifice and offering sufferings to the Lord. In order for these sacrifices to bear fruit, they had to be offered with joy. Although just as tired as everyone else, Sister Claire suddenly jumped up and walked over to a group of the girls. With an exaggerated southern drawl, she said, You know, when you walk, y'all look just like me. She started doing a ridiculous cowboy gait, making the entire room burst into laughter as they looked at the cowboy nun and recognised themselves in her imitation. And you know what you all look like, she said, pointing to another girl. Everyone continued to laugh as she did the second imitation. One girl asked, what's your name? Sister Claire turned toward her very seriously and responded without hesitation, me, I'm John Wayne, and she continued to do her western stride, accompanied by the cackles of the young girls. The activities of the Servant Sisters in Jacksonville were not limited to Assumption School and Parish. Our third mission is the conquest of young people for the Lord, so any opportunity to work directly with young people is well received. The sisters were frequently invited to speak at high schools or universities in the area. Father Fred Park, then pastor at Assumption, was invited to give a talk about Catholicism during a world religion class at the local community college in September of 2007. He knew he could give a good theoretical introduction to Christ and the church, but he thought that the sisters would add a real plus to the class. The testimony of religious life would allow the students to see a true and radical response to the Christian message. Most had never seen sisters in a habit before. As Father Fred and the sisters walked through the campus, the students gaped in astonishment. It looked as if we had stepped out of a spaceship, Father Fred recalls. They arrived in the classroom where 40 students awaited. There was a great variety in the class, other Christian denominations, atheists, agnostics, Buddhists and Muslims. After Father Fred gave an introduction, Sister Claire spoke about what it meant to be a consecrated as a religious sister. The vows we make, our daily life, the importance of the Eucharist, etc. After she explained the vows of chastity, a student bluntly posed the question, You mean you don't have sex? Sister Claire was totally unflappable. She was not scandalised by this or any of their questions, but calmly responded, No, there are more important things than that. She talked about her life as an actress. I had all that was out there, but it didn't give me real peace. She was so convincing precisely because she was very close to their age, just 25 years old at the time, and so full of life and enthusiasm. The lesson time came to an end after an hour, but the students did not want to leave. Father Fred stood off to the side and the young people gathered around Sister Claire and the other sisters and continued to ask questions. As they left, several students walked with them to the van across the campus. Father Fred had never seen anything like that before. The professor invited the sisters back to another class just a week later and then on subsequent occasions. Sister Claire wrote an email to Father Raphael about a visit to a university classroom in October of the following year. The young people knew that before becoming a sister I had studied theatre and wanted to be an actress so they asked me to tell my vocation and talk about how we can use our talents to give glory to God. There were about 40 university-age students and they really paid close attention. I told them my vocation story 
They laughed a lot, but I also took advantage of the opportunity to light a fire under them. I talked to them about the terrible burden of superficiality and how the television, music, etc. brainwashes them. That girls shouldn't be treated as objects and boys are not pigs, so it's high time they stop acting like pigs. They nodded their heads. They wanted me to do a skit. I saw this as a little dangerous because they might think I'm still an actress or that I'm just a cool or funny sister. And that wasn't the point. I was there to witness to the Lord's mercy and not to make friends or put on a show. And I told them so. So instead of acting, we brought a two to three minute video on the true meaning of love. I think it touched them. Pray for us, Father, that we can do all this for God's glory and the salvation of souls. We're really excited about being able to work with young people. From the very beginning, the sisters in Jacksonville would invite young women over to their house for Sister Bucks coffee with the sisters on Sunday evenings. They would also frequently speak at, to young people at parish youth groups or at home of the mother activities organised by the sisters for young women, such as meetings, retreats, pilgrimages and summer camps. Her summers were always full of activities to bring children and young people to Jesus Christ. In the summer of 2007, she went to Spain to renew her vows for three years and then returned for a summer camp in Florida and another in New Hampshire. The sisters also helped out at the parish day camp at Assumption. In the summer of 2008, she did two summer camps in Florida and a pilgrimage to New York to visit the shrine of the North American Martyrs. During the month of July, the sisters offered activities for teenage girls three times a week to give them something productive to do during the summer. In 2009, she, together with all the sisters, went to Spain in June for spiritual exercises on the 25th anniversary of the foundation of the Servant Sisters. She then returned to the USA for two summer camps, one for younger girls in Florida and one for older girls in Georgia in the Great Smoky Mountains. All these activities were real opportunities the Lord gave to Sister Claire to surrender herself for the salvation of young people. She had an insatiable desire to bring more and more young people to Christ. As outlined in the anecdote at the beginning of this chapter, Sister Claire had a gift for uplifting spirits, even in the most difficult situations. Another example of this talent is her improvised summer camp television programme, Life with the Home. One evening during a summer camp, everyone was exhausted after the day's activity and the humid Florida heat. The girls began to complain. They did not want to take part in the songs and all the sisters were a bit at a loss on how to improve the situation. One sister was thinking that they should just send the girls off to bed. Sister Claire got up with a look of determination and grabbed the microphone. She was not going to let the devil have the last word that day with this spirit of complaint and melancholy. Together with Sister Grace, she called all the girls together for Life with the Home. Good evening to all of you who are watching us live on Life with the Home, she started off after walking onto the stage amidst applauses and the introduction music. I am here with Sister Grace Silao, my fellow presenter, and we are live from Madison, Florida. Cameras, please make sure you catch the faces of all these young ladies who have come to the studio to be with us live tonight, Sister Grace interrupted. Say hello to the cameras. I am sure all your families are watching, Sister Claire added. The girls loved the improvised show and would actually start waving at the cameras. Sister Grace was sometimes nervous. She would not know what to say next. But Sister Claire reassured her, don't worry, just follow me. The two would then proceed to call different girls up to the TV platform, which was actually one of the picnic tables in the dining hall, for an interview on the day's activities, what they thought about the discussion meeting earlier or the camp's motto. They would also have them come up and sing a song or do karaoke. They received live phone calls from outside the studio on the walkie-talkies. The girls would have a lot of laughs, but Sister Claire and Sister Grace would also make sure to elevate the conversations and make the girls reflect. This soon became an evening tradition at the camps. In her apostolate with young people, one of Sister Claire's favourite topics was authenticity and superficiality. She would often use the Spanish word for sincere, which is made up by two words, sin without and cera wax. We have to be without wax, without a mask, without hypocrisy and falseness. We have to truly be ourselves and not a character on a stage. We must follow our convictions and be faithful to the gospel, not worrying about what others think of us. When we are superficial, we are more concerned about the appearance of our exterior image, of our mask, than about the true good of our souls. 
She had struggled to overcome her own superficiality during her time as a candidate and novice, letting God take off her masks and show her who she truly was. Young people now perceived her as incredibly authentic. Everything she said and did, it was her. She was 100%. Everything that she did was with her whole self and she wasn't afraid to let everyone know who she was and that she was God's property. She defended the Lord and the truth with her whole self. Sister Claire rejected what was directly superficial, but that did not mean she was constantly giving talks about the Holy Trinity. As we have often seen, she took advantage of the simplest things to make young people laugh and feel at home. A classic example of this is her Indian names. In the summer of 2007 in Spain, Sister Claire spent a few weeks going to Las Presillas, a town a few minutes away from Zurita, with a group of girls to help out with the construction of the servant priests and brothers' new house. While she worked with the girls, they would have some profound conversations and other hilarious ones. It was hard work, but Sister Claire made it full of laughs as well. At one point, they started making up Indian names. Sister Claire gave Sasha Smith the name Crazy Hair due to her wild curly hair, and Kelly fought the name Mighty Smoke, since she would always take short breaks to smoke a cigarette. These little jokes often had more to them. Kelly, who is now Sister Kelly, writes, There in Las Prosillas, I would take a break during work time to smoke, and instead of scolding me, she took it lightly. She made it a joke by using it in my Indian name. That doesn't mean that she agreed with my vice. I do remember that she sometimes asked me if I would be able to stop smoking for love of the Lord, but she never said it in a way that made me feel judged. Sasha gave Sister Claire the name Blue Stick due to her blue work habit, and the pick or shovel that she always had in her hand. The following summer, Sasha went on a pilgrimage with the sisters to New York. The pilgrimage was set in an atmosphere of the North American Indians as they visited the shrine of St. Kateri Tekakwitha and the shrine of Our Lady of Martyrs, where St. Kateri was born and where three Jesuit missionaries were martyred at the hands of the Indians. After hearing about the Indian names, the girls asked Sister Claire for their own name, and thus the Indian tribe was born. In future activities, whenever someone new arrived, all the girls would say, Sister Claire, so-and-so doesn't have an Indian name. Sister Claire would assent and look intently upon the new girl. She would explain that she had to wait for the inspiration. At some point in the day, the moment would come and the name would be given. It was simple and absurd, but it helped to create a joyful environment and unity in the group of girls. Once you had an Indian name, you were undoubtedly accepted into the group. On one road trip, Sister Claire and the girls wrote the tribe song, We are one tribe, we are one tribe, we are one tribe in this world. Some of the Indian names for the girls and for the other sisters as well were Laughing Peach, Dancing Bull, Silent Storm, Sitting Peacock, Meek Pigeon, Red Bird, Fierce Squirrel, Running Forest, Flying Turtle and Smooth Turkey. It's amazing how the names really fit those who received them. Very closely tied to the subject of superficiality and authenticity was that of mediocrity, another favourite topic of Sister Claire's. One member of the youth group at Assumption remembers how strongly Sister Claire would speak to them. Do you think that you are good just because you go to Sunday Mass? What do you do when you are not at church? In the book of Revelation, God says that if you are neither hot nor cold, he will vomit you from his mouth. She trusted that the Holy Spirit would work in their hearts to help them understand these seemingly harsh words. As she writes in an email to Father Raphael, This is one of the things I've learned here, that we have to say the truth without fear, and I've seen the power of God's word in souls and how the Holy Spirit works through us. She said the truth without fear, but also with love. When she spoke clearly and challenged young people, they perceived that she did so out of love for them, seeking the salvation of their souls. Sister Claire would bring these reflections about mediocrity down to concrete things, such as listening to music. She would often use a documentary about the dangers of rock music. She asked young people to reflect upon the rhythm and lyrics of the songs they would listen to and sing. The rhythm in itself was designed to lead them to sensuality, and the lyrics were often directly sinful. One young woman erased 1,000 songs from her iPod after a hiking trip with the sisters. Another erased all but 10 of the 316 songs on hers. Not even Christian music was enough for Sister Claire. She told young people they could not just listen to Christian music. They had to turn it into a sincere prayer. If they were singing about giving their lives to the Lord, 
They had to be authentic. Otherwise, she insisted, it would be better not to sing at all. One of her favourites at the time was a song by Danielle Rose entitled Let It Be Done Unto Me with the words of Our Lady at the Annunciation. Singing was a way for her to pray and remain united with the Lord as she worked and did tasks around the house. She once heard another sister give a talk based on an article by the French Dominican Garigou Lagrange about retarded souls. These souls do not grow due to their negligence and spiritual sloth. They are good people, but they are not generous with the Lord. They constantly put limits to what they give him and so do not become the saints they are called to be. She loved the talk and immediately asked for a copy to be able to use it herself with young people. Garagou Lagrange writes, Some souls, because of their negligence or spiritual sloth, do not pass from the age of beginners to that of proficient. These are retarded souls. In the spiritual life, they are like abnormal children who do not happily pass through the crisis of adolescence and who, though they do not remain children, never reach the full development of maturity. The two main causes of this stunt in growth is negligence in little things and the refusal to make sacrifices. Sister Claire would use her talent as an actress to imitate the girls and give examples of this spiritual sloth. Sister Claire would have them rolling on the floor in laughter as she imitated these retarded souls. But the message got across. We have to be saints. It's all or nothing. We can't remain in mediocrity. We have to fight with all our strength against the obstacles that impede us from growing. She said the truth clearly and directly, without hiding or diminishing its clarity. She did so, however, with a sense of humour that made it easier to accept, even though her words often implied a huge change of lifestyle for some of the girls. Sister Claire would speak to the young women about their way of dressing and the importance of modesty and chastity. She told them to ask themselves when they looked in the mirror in the morning, How many souls will go to hell today because of me? Some might have taken offence at these words. Sister Claire would explain what she meant patiently, but she never watered down the truth. She knew they often did not have the intention of making others sin when they dressed immodestly, but she helped them see that their vanity could have fatal effects on others, leading them to sins of impurity regardless of the girl's original intentions. Many women turned to Sister Claire for spiritual direction. She did everything she could to help them grow in their relationship with the Lord, without denying him anything. She would give them lists of things to work on so as to grow in the spiritual life and remove all the obstacles that the devil and the world placed on their paths. One young woman preserves many letters and notes Sister Claire wrote to her. Here is an example of a to-do list Sister Claire wrote after a conversation they had. She saw this young woman needed to radically change her life and reject sin definitively so she could live in the state of grace. This meant she would have to leave behind certain friends. Things to do as soon as possible, like tomorrow. Close Facebook account. Change email address. Call father. Make an appointment for this week before Sunday. Big must do. Go to confession every week. Pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet every day and the rosary, asking for the grace to have a free heart in order to do God's will. Sister Claire was also firmly convinced that frequent reception of the Eucharist was fundamental for growth in the spiritual life. She was often very demanding of young people regarding their attendance at Mass, strongly encouraging them to attend Mass daily if possible. One young woman, who had made a commitment as a member of the Home of the Mother to go to daily Mass, called Sister Claire for advice at the beginning of a new school year. She had realised that the only way she could go to Mass on Fridays was to get up at 5 a.m., She was convinced that 5am was ridiculously early and Sister Claire would obviously be fine with her missing Mass just one day of the week. However, to her surprise, Sister Claire was very firm with her. She reminded her of our Lord's love on the cross and all his sufferings that took place precisely on a Friday. The least this young woman could do to console him on the cross was to make a bigger effort on Friday mornings to go to Mass. Another young girl relates that Sister Claire was very stern when she needed to be but then she was so gentle and loving when I needed that as well. She describes her as a spiritual mother. Sister Claire knew how to relate to young girls in high school and college who were struggling with worldly things because she herself had been involved in all that and knew how to help them. She helped many young women with more specific and complicated difficulties, such as anorexia. 
She had a firm belief in the power of and need for prayer. When we pray for others, we can help them change their way of thinking and obtain the strength to change their lives. Sister Claire would pray very intensely for those entrusted to her care. Our Lord granted her a grace at one point, letting her know very clearly that he did indeed listen to her prayers and that she should never doubt this. Yesterday I received a grace. The Lord spoke very clearly to me. I've been praying for a girl here in Jacksonville, the one that suffers a lot, that she would stay or go back to the Lord. And that's what happened. The Lord told me, I hear you. I hear you. I listen to you, Claire. Have no doubt. There were moments in her spiritual direction when Sister Claire's heroism would come to light. One day a young woman was meeting with Sister Claire and she obviously had no idea that Sister Claire was feeling sick. All of a sudden, as they were talking, Sister Claire interrupted her. Hang on, I'm going to be sick. And she went running out to throw up. Clearly, when Sister Claire returned, the young woman told her that they could continue the conversation another day when Sister Claire was feeling better. Sister Claire had suffered headaches earlier on in her life, but when she arrived in Jacksonville, time had passed since she had had any strong ones. They began again around her third year in Jacksonville. In the summer, during a visit to Spain, she consulted a friend of ours who was a neurologist, telling him her symptoms. The doctor immediately recognised the symptoms as migraines and gave her some tips to help. Sister Isabel Cuesta, who was Sister Claire's superior in her third year in Jacksonville and also later in Valencia, speaks about how Sister Claire affronted these migraines. She didn't make a big deal out of it. That is, she didn't speak about it. They were a part of daily life, the price that she had to pay. When the Lord asked her to endure a headache, she didn't think twice about it. A year or two later, she would frequently ask our Lord to break her plans. And so when a migraine came, she could not say no to him. If he wanted to break her plans and permit it to be difficult or impossible for her to do other activities, she accepted it wholeheartedly or tried to at least. Sister Claire used her acting talents to hide the fact that she was not feeling well. She would inform her superior and take the medication given to her, but those around her normally did not notice. She sometimes had to lie down and rest, but she never showed an attitude of feeling sorry for herself or focusing on her own pain. As soon as she was able to, she would get up and continue with her tasks. Where did she get the strength to accept her sufferings with such joy and spirit of faith? She herself answers in an email to Father Raphael. Meditating on the Lord's passion gives me a lot of strength. Whenever I do, I really experience my nothingness. The other day, while I was meditating on his passion, I felt his gaze penetrating through me to the deepest recesses of my being. I felt profound pain at seeing how little I love him and how much I offend him. However, at the same time, I felt peace and strength. Nothing else mattered to me and I felt like I could do anything for him. Even though I see my littleness, at the same time, I see his greatness and his mercy and that strengthens me. The meditation on Christ's passion was her constant source of strength, how to respond to so much love. This morning on meditating the passion, I stayed with the Lord in prison. I wept out of true sorrow for all I have done and do. This is what my infidelities have done to the Lord. I felt how Our Lady gave me her hands to cry in. She wiped my tears and presented them to the Lord. I felt a profound sorrow, yet at the same time peace. I stayed there with him. I sang to him. I accompanied him. I begged his forgiveness and asked him for the strength to stop offending him. He told me he would do it all over again for me. My God, help me to respond to this love. Free me from what ties me down. May I always have Christ, Christ crucified before me. Everything is nothing. That's what I experience when I contemplate his passion. When I'm here in front of the very same Jesus in the Eucharist, you are everything. Because she was so convinced of her nothingness and her total dependence on Christ and his mercy, he was able to little by little transform her by his grace. The date of her perpetual vows was soon approaching. The following year would be full of temptations and difficulties. It seems that the devil was planning new ways to attack her and discourage her. Our Lord would permit this trial so as to purify her love and to free her from everything that tied her down and kept her from flying to him. Mm-hmm.